this happen through us, your servants. Amen.
very inspiring. Our prayer of confession is about that today, because some of us, you know, have uh, you know situations in our lives where we might say, "I give up," but our prayer of confession addresses that today. So let us share the prayer of confession together. It is easy to scoff, merciful one, when we behold those with unflinching faith and unquestioned assurance of your power. Often have we a back like the mourners in Jairus' house when told that death will be swallowed up in the power of your love. Heal not only our illnesses and ailments, Holy One. Heal our fearfulness of heart and the inconsistency of our faith. As we yearn for your healing touch, help us to wait deep longing for more than those who wait for the morning. Amen. My friends, hear the good news. God turns us around, opens our eyes, renews our faith, forgives our sins. We are truly blessed, and the people of God, no matter where they are, say together, In complete earnestness and in the love we have kindled in you, 
see that you also excel in the grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others may be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. May God bless the reading of his word on this very special Sunday morning. <coughs> now I hope a scene like this has never happened at Wicklip, but there's a story about a church member who stopped the pastor and angrily complained that the church had made an exorbitant purchase. They bought five new rooms. An expenditure this member thought was completely unnecessary. Five new rooms. The pastor was surprised at the man's reaction and mentioned it to the church treasurer who responded, It is understandable. How would you feel if you saw everything you gave in the past year tied up in five rooms? Churches often have expectations about how much parishioners should give. There are even studies done on it. There are stewardship campaigns designed to increase individual involvement. However, even churches can take it, can take it to cup fire. Uh, my wife and I have a niece named Nicole, who's very outspoken, right? She was a member of a church that she's not a member of anymore in Northwest Indiana. And she needed a letter from the pastor to prove she was a member. The pastor told him he wasn't going to write one. Well, why would you ask that a pastor wouldn't write a letter? See, the call in his mind had not attended church well enough. He told the call she had only attended church 20% of the time he expected her to. Therefore, he, you know, and also because of that, may have only turned in about 20% of her pledge. So finally the pastor told her that since she gave 20% of a commitment, he would write 20% of a letter. It sounds incredible, doesn't it? Not really. Consider the history of tithing. In the years following the Acts of the Apostles, the church started to grow. The church then enacted laws to ensure that the priests in the church buildings were supported based on the precepts of the Old Testament. Mandatory tithing came about as a result. The first recorded legislation is found in the letter of the bishops to center in Tours, France in 567 A.D. and then the, at the can, the canons of the Council of Macon in 585. At that time the church viewed tithes in accord with divine law since they were instituted by God himself. The practice of tithing fluctuated throughout Europe. However, in countries like France, tithing was the law. The monks would collect a 10% tax from everyone and would take the belongings of people who could not pay. In other words, you paid or else. After the Protestant Reformation, if you recall some of Martin Luther's objections, this was one of them. And then after the French Revolution and the growing secularization of civil governments, mandatory tithing fell into somewhat disuse. 
Churches then had to raise their own funds to keep operating. Some churches, like Whitlet, left the decision up to the members. As, as you can see, churches like Nicole's were a lot more forceful than any of the churches I served in this area. Now, what's the right thing to do? Jesus relied totally on charity throughout his ministry and expected his disciples to, this, to do the same. Remember when he sent his disciples out two by two? He basically told them not to carry much of anything. The Apostle Paul many times explained how he paid his own way on his missionary journeys. You see, in those days, biblical teachers were required to have a trade, just like Jesus did. And the theory was that they would support themselves because they rightly could not charge anyone for teaching them. However, the church was growing so fast that the need for some method of charitable support for those members who needed it was becoming more and more clear. Paul's first response to this was to authorize Titus to make a collection for the church members in Jerusalem that needed it. That was the backdrop for the text that we read. Early in the chapter, Paul had spoken to the churches in Macedonia that he referred to in our text, when he responded to the collection. Paul writes, in the midst of severe trial, their overflowing joy and deep poverty have produced an abundant generosity. According to their means, indeed I can testify even beyond their means, and voluntarily they begged us insistently for the favor of sharing in the service with other members of the church. Now Paul is asking the church at Corinth to do exactly the same thing. Note that Paul specifically said he is not commanding them to do it. Instead, he uses this as a teaching moment to show why Christians should give what they have to those that may be less fortunate than they are. He based his example, uh, lesson on the example of Jesus Christ. Jesus chose to take human form and minister among us. He chose to grow up in a working class family, don't forget. Remember, he had brothers and sisters. He chose to have few possessions. He had no other home address. If you wanted to send him a Christmas card, where would you send it to? I guess you'd have to send it to Bethany. It was the only house that I know of that he would stop from time to time. However, he gave away riches to all who believe in him. Jesus used the riches that he had to purchase us from the slavery of sin, which allows us to join the kingdom of God. He offered us other riches, too. The riches of forgiveness, justification, regeneration, and eternal life. Remember, the ministry of Jesus was a giving ministry. That is why Paul said that Jesus became poor and we became rich. It was this ministry of caring and sharing. Paul wanted to expand to all Christians including those of the church in Corinth. Paul praises the Corinthians and the gifts they have made to enhance the kingdom. These gifts included faith, speech, knowledge, and diligence. Now Paul is asking them to add one more gift, and that is the gift of generosity. Paul tells the Corinthians that generosity is part of the Christian makeup. It's who we are. All that must happen now, for that is when for generosity must show itself. The collection that Titus is taking is an excellent opportunity at that time for them to do that. Now, we should look at this story from the Corinthian church's point of view. Today we give as good stewards to maintain our church building, compensate the staff, and support the mission and work of the denomination. We can see what our gifts have brought. Look at what the gifts have brought right here. Now, what tangible benefits could the Corinthians see, especially since the collection that Titus was taking was going to an entirely different part of the world? 
Paul saw it this way. The church started in Jerusalem, and through their generosity, the rules were changed to allow the Corinthians to join the kingdom of God without undergoing the rituals that the Jewish faith had required. Paul saw the Christian church as a family where generosity was offered when and where it was needed. This led Paul to tell the Corinthians that they give to others when they have plenty, they will receive in return when their need arises. To Paul, Jesus was the model that showed how caring for others should be as much a part of Christian living as prayer, study, and worship. Now, some might take this one step too far and suggest each time we support the church or a charity, we are covering ourselves in case we need the service someday. Former pastors of Wycliffe could tell you about the number of times someone who attended this church sporadically expected them to drop everything to care for them in the moment. After all, they might have given to the church once or twice. They don't exactly remember when. The church should be obligated to respond because that is supposed to be what we do and what we are in business for. However, church members like you who support the church for the right reasons are grateful when the church does come through for them. For example, my mother and father were both actively involved at the East Side United Methodist Church in Chicago. And my father was involved with the Lions Club that met there. And as it turns out, many of the church members were also Lions Club members. When the time came, my Lions Club delivered a power chair to, the to my dad's house so my dad could get up and sit down more easily because he was taking care of my mother. Sure, the Lions Club was there when dad needed them, but that's not why he joined the Lions in the first place. He joined the Lions for the fellowship and the chance to help people. Now, my dad spent years selling tickets for spaghetti dinners and Lions Club fundraisers. He went out and got glasses. Remember, the Lions Club has a thing where they recycle glasses. You would not believe every time I go around the neighborhood after he passed away how many people came up and knew him from the Lions Club. And the teller at the bank that he did business with Told, told us of how she really appreciated the fact that he was her sponsor. My dad never thought that the Lions Club ever owed him anything in return. Now, if you get, if you get the idea uh, how, how, how committed my father was, we lived on a four-lane street with a double yellow line going up the middle of it, right outside the house. He and his 80s would stand on that double yellow line. There's a stop sign there. And walk up and try to get people to buy Lions Club tickets. We watched him. Nobody was going to talk him out of it. Every time I went to settle his affairs in every bank, they said, I remember your father. He was a great guy. He was always in here selling something. But he never looked at the idea that this was going to buy him something in return that, they, you know, that, he, that he was owed. Now let's look at a, more, a different example, and maybe a more powerful one. In 1999, Kevin Steffen of Lancaster, New York, was a bat boy for his younger brother's Little League baseball team. During a game, a player who was warming up accidentally hit Kevin in the chest with a bat. Kevin fell to the ground unconscious and his heart stopped beating. Now, Kevin says, all I remember is all of a sudden I got hit in the chest with something and I turned around and passed out. Penny Brown, a nurse whose son played on the team, was able to revive Kevin. Anybody got an idea where this is going? Seven years later, Penny Brown was eating at the Hillview Restaurant in Depew, New York, when she began to choke on her food. 
The food was not going anywhere, and I totally couldn't breathe, said Penny, and it was very frightening. Imagine it would be. Patrons screamed for help. One of the restaurant employees, a volunteer firefighter, you have to understand in that part of New York there's a lot of volunteer fire departments. This volunteer firefighter ran out from the back. He wrapped his arms around Penny and applied the Heimlich maneuver and saved her life. Now you would think that she would have thought that since I saved somebody else's life, it was somebody had to do this for me. Except in this case, the firefighter was Kevin Stephan, the boy whose life Penny saved seven years earlier. What Penny Brown did in 1999 was an act of caring, and she didn't expect anything in return. She's a nurse. That's what she was trained to do. Kevin Stephan did not take the time to ask who needed help when she was, you know, and Penny was uh, had, unable to breathe. He acted. The fact that these two people had their own lives crossed in this way was a coincidence. Or was it? As a nurse, Penny Brown did as she was trained to do. She did not ask the person who the person was that needed help. Firefighter Kevin Stephan did as he was trained to do. He did not have the time to ask who needed help. They both acted as Jesus would have done had he been there, and that is the real message for us today. What defines good stewardship in the modern world? We Presbyterians have the book of order that states that we should support the ministry of the church by giving money, time, and talent. Notice that it is up to us to decide how much time, how many talents, and how much money. The Arlington Catholic Herald offers some good advice. They say, although we may not have a rule of tithing, we do have the duty to support the needs of the church, whether the international, presbytery, or church level. Each of us should evaluate what we do to give back to God through the support of the church and Cheney charitable organization. For example, we should ask, do I give to God each week at least what I spend on entertainment, such as a movie? Do I give uh, to God at least one hour's worth of my 40-hour paycheck? Keep in mind that time and talents matter as much as money. I led a stewardship committee at John Knox Presbyterian some, back, some years back, and we looked at our pledge card. And it was like any other pledge card. You've seen them. Well, for next year, I'm going to give $5 a week, $10 a week, $25 a week, $50 a week, or other, right? Now it says, we didn't like that. Our committee decided that it was the commitment that mattered, not the amount. We felt that spending an hour in a food kitchen has as much value in God's eyes as a $5 contribution. As a result, we decided to add two other boxes to the pledge card that people could check. One of them was, I will pray regularly. And the other was, I will offer time and talent in the service of the church. Now, there meant that that was a, that every person had a box that they could legitimately check. Even if they didn't want to commit to a monetary amount, they could have selected any one of the other two. This was a liberal way of looking at giving what Paul wanted the growing Christian church to have. We have seen liberality to this day. That's why so many hospitals were started by Christians, not for profit, but to care for the sick. That is why so many people choose to live in poor neighborhoods to help those who live there. The central neighborhood of Cleveland, there was a Catholic priest who lived there that worked with Habitat for Humanity and he worked with the families as we were building houses there. He knew them all. They knew where he lived. That is why so many people give their time and talents to serve as elders, deacons, trustees, to care for the members and friends of their church. That is why elder commissioners will give up one week of their vacation this week to serve the General Assembly in Salt Lake City, Utah. 
That is why church people will bring meals to the homebound when they are needed, whether it be through Meals on Wheels or a simple act of kindness. When it comes to caring for each other, Christians don't need to keep score. You never have to worry about getting a 20% of a letter from me, like my niece did. After all, I have seen the Christian generosity has worked here throughout the two and a half years I've been here at the Wycliffe Church and for the year that we've been here worshiping with you. If Titus had come to you, you would have found a way to support him. What we must continue to do is act as Jesus would, even with our limited resources. That, Paul says, is what being a part of the Christian church is all about. Praise be to God. Amen. Because if you don't have both, 
Then you have a situation like this, where the uh, Reverend Dick Trickle was the uh, head of uh, uh, the, this, this, the mission on East 55th Street in Cleveland. They had all kinds of programs going. And a man walked into his office and said, I want to build a homeless shelter. Okay. I'll give you the money. You can run it. Just make sure my name is put on it. And uh, Reverend Trickle said, well, wait a minute. We, uh, we, we pretty much have enough shelters. What we don't have is the people who are committed to them who come down and volunteer their time and efforts to make them go. The guy walked out. See, without both, just putting up a building doesn't mean a thing. What means, what means matters is, is there, are pe uh, there are people willing to make the commitment to the ministry that fills the building and makes the ministry work. And that's what we are about as a church, and I'm sure that's what you are about here at Breckenridge Village. I know your spiritual care team's got all kinds of good stuff going, and they should be uh, thanked for and so, my friends, keep in mind that we have uh, a lot of gifts that we can offer in God's service. And that is what is important today. Now let us share the prayer of dedication that is, that is uh, printed up on the screen. And let us bow our heads for prayer. Forgive me, one. We humble ourselves before you with these gifts. Brought in thanksgiving for your forgiveness of your people and for your ongoing work in our hearts and minds. Bless these gifts as the beginning of service to others. In your name, amen. several of us. How is your family doing? 
Um, Henry uh, has got three weeks before back surgery. Uh, he's having problems again, can't walk again, and he's got three weeks to go. I gave him through that. How about you? I'm doing okay. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Uh, our music crew just came back from a reunion over in, where, where in Massachusetts? Cape Cod. In Boston? Uh, uh, Cape Cod. Oh, Cape Cod! <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's a little difference there. Did you get out of the water? Um, well, they had a little uh, swimming pool, <laughs> but that's about it. But um, yeah, we had a wonderful time. It was great to see a little 20 people. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Hopefully the weather was good. Oh, it was fabulous, yes. A little bit of um, sprinkling rain, but otherwise it was good. Okay. Uh, Ellen, is Shirley still being Shirley? Well, she was very um, incoherent this week. She, did, she wanted to sleep a lot. And I talked, she didn't even know who I was. She, who are you? You know, so um, just got to keep praying for her. Yeah, pray for her caregivers. Uh, Karen also, yeah, she really is super Karen. Yeah, yeah they, they've been trying to keep her awake by talking to her, and it's uh, become a daily thing, and yes. that can catch up to you after a while. So let's continue to pray for Shirley and Karen and their family. Whole family. Are there uh, any others that, that I miss? Oh, Mike, how are you doing? But is, is, are you able to eat a little better? A little better. Still got to get careful. Yeah, we got to, yeah, because we got the thrift store coming up. We got to make sure that you can sample some of that black cuisine. <laughs> uh, again, uh, our thrift store is uh, this week, and it's uh, it's on Saturday from uh, nine to one over at the Wakefield Church. And any one of you is invited to come and uh, uh, join us. And I don't know what Thelma's making. She, she keeps that a secret. <laughs> but we're also having a Christmas in July this month. Oh. <laughs> Upstairs. Well, actually, that's not so crazy because the Hallmark Channel is going to have uh, new Christmas movies all month, so why not have yeah. Christmas in July? All right, let us remember those with joys and those with concerns as we uh, share our morning prayer. Uh, let us pray. Lord God, creator and sustainer of all things large and small, we thank you for your love and caring that you bestow on us each and every day. We thank you for your son Jesus, who told us how we can accomplish great things when we may remain connected to him. We thank the Apostle Paul who reminded us that we should do what we can to help those less fortunate whether it be sharing financially or sharing our gifts in their behalf. Lord, help us to work to reduce conflicts in this world. We continue to pray for restraint to diffuse threats to escalate the conflict in Gaza. And we pray that some solution may come soon for this conflict. Be with those who are trying to bring humanitarian aid, not only in the Gaza, but in places like Sudan that desperately need it. Help us to work together to properly address conflicts in the Ukraine, Ethiopia, and any other hot spots that we know of. Lord, we will celebrate Independence Day this week. We thank you for inspiring the Founding Fathers to allow religious freedom throughout our land. We thank you for allowing us to choose how we will worship you and for the freedom to establish and maintain ministries like ours. Lord, several of your children are experiencing periods of pain or distress or have simply lost their way. Today we offer special prayers for Thelma who continues to recover, for Hilda, Heidi, and Shirley who are recovering. Kenny, who continues his treatments as well. We pray for Jason, who awaits the next step in his treatment. We ask that you be with uh, Sally and Lisa, who have long-term health concerns. 
We ask that you be with Henry, Mike, Renee, Tony, and Linda as well. You have known these people since before they were born, and you know their plights today. We ask that you provide the guidance and healing that you know they need. We also ask for guidance and healing for any caregivers that are giving care to them. For we know that it is a special responsibility, and with your help, we can carry it out to the best of our ability. We also ask for your guidance and healing for a sympathetic and sympathetic hand for those things we know that we may not have spoken out loud today. Help us to remember that we are to be your ambassadors of hope and love, not only for people that we know, but for anyone you would lead us to. Lord God, we pray for our church and for this facility and their respective ministries. Be with the chaplain and the spiritual care team here as they meet the needs of the residents. Be with the Wicklet volunteers as they prepare to open the thrift store this week. Remind us that we continue to be your eyes, ears, mouth, arms, legs, and hearts as we take these ministries you have entrusted to us, not only within these confines, but into the community and beyond. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now, my friends, as our worship comes to a close, let us stand in those who are able and sing our closing hymn.
we got this big birthday celebration coming up, but you don't even have to have a birthday in uh, July to join us. We do know that there will be a nice cake. Dave's responsible for the cake. He makes sure it's nice. And a little bit of ice cream, maybe a few other things right after the service. We'll also be celebrating the uh, uh, Sacrament of Holy Communion. So any of you at, uh, here at Breckenridge Village are first certainly welcome, and we have plenty of prime, prime seats available. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and every day to come. Amen. Amen.